Hmm, fashionably on time. Perfect. Shall we? Let's go. It's time. Murray will be here in a moment. Fashionably on time. Oh, welcome, everybody. Uh, here we go. Our area director is here. We may start. <laughs> Welcome to the JMAP and Extra combined session. We have JMAP first, Extra afterwards. The agenda we have has slightly more time for Extra. Um, so hopefully things will fit in. We have, I think, more than I expected. So timing is pretty tight. Let's mute that thing. Shall we get straight into it? <clears throat> it's already the second day of the IATF. Hopefully everyone here has seen the note. Well, if you haven't, please do just search IETF note well so that you can read these things. Yeah, thanks. Um, this tells you the conditions under which you're operating here, that your work is public, that yeah, there are certain requirements around intellectual property. So please do make sure you're aware of this uh, before slash as you contribute. And we also have the note very well around harassment and behavior. Again, do please make sure you are compliant with this and behaving yourself appropriately. Um, be respectful of everyone here. Some tips on how to use the client. The Medeco client has changed. I'm sure we've practiced and we know exactly how it's going to work, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah we're, we're on top of it. Um, it, does, it does look pretty. Uh, yeah, but do make sure if you're in the room and you log into the full client, remember to mute your computer. I didn't do it in dispatch and I had a lovely echo for a little while until I figured out what was going on. And just managed to do the oh, same thing again here. That was me. Yeah, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, more resources. Obviously, the uh, the top one there is important. Go there, figure out the agenda, find yourself in this warren of rooms. All right, let's get on to business. So this is the agenda we have at the moment. Uh, about forty minutes for JMAP, about seventy minutes for Extra, including a quick look at the new rechartering process that we're hoping to kick off soon um, and the charter text that's currently in draft. Do we, hang on, just before we head on, do we have any agenda bashing? Does anyone have them? I guess it's too early for that, isn't it? Um, but anything else we want to, <laughs> we'll get to that in each section. Cool. All right. So JMAP, um, we have a couple of documents in working group last call. We have four existing drafts. Um, some of which probably should be in last call and I just haven't done it yet. And we have the portability work again. Um, does anyone have any other business for JMAP before we get straight down into that? Yes. Uh, the tracker shows I'm waiting for a revised ID on JMAP access. Oh, sorry, that's an extra document. This All right, thank you, Murray. All right, so um, JMAP Civ. Oops. This was the next one. <laughs> we we'll talk about that later. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the most important part. That was just in case. Let's let's finish the JMAP first. Um, so it should be separate slides for this, hopefully. Uh, right. There are no slides for JMAP Civ because oh, good. it's in last call, and I don't believe there's been any comments. All right. Um, then I guess we'll push the buttons and send it off. <clears throat> Sounds good. Thank you. Cool. Easy. All right. Next after Seal. <coughs> Do I need to get the agenda up here so I can check what's going on? Yeah, maybe. That's a bit bad. Seal sharing. Yep. Yeah, that's next slide. Can I do sharing contacts and calendars all together? I think sure. It might, might make sense. So sharing, you put uh, on there as in um, working group last call, which it should be. I don't know that as actually officially happened. It was meant to, but yeah. I was trying to see so whether I, dropped, I, I dropped a lot of balls back in July. Yeah, so I think that um, should have gone to last call um, Yeah, at the last meeting, and I think just hasn't, but nothing's changed. So that will go to last call. Uh, contacts and calendars. I was just having a look at both those now. The JS contact um, 
uh, spec is basically done. I think it should be published very, very soon. It's cleared all the final um, comments. Wow, that's a lot of finals on. on <laughs> I did not say that many times. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where the computer comes to get us. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> okay. Anyway, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so um, slightly distracted by that. Uh, yes, so um, I've just published an updated JMAP contacts and JMAP calendar spec, but there's no... Um, it's just editorial fixes. I just went through it one more time to see if there was any little nits that needed fixing to clarify a few things and like put um, fix some type signatures, but no actual semantic changes. So uh, I actually think both of those are ready. Um, once JS Contact is finished, I think we've uh, well published. I think I can update the RFC references in the JMAP Contact spec to reference it, and then that's probably ready for last call. So hopefully even before the next um, meeting, uh, unless anyone has any other comments on it. And similarly for calendars, we were just waiting for JS Calendar BIS, which was trying to maybe um, update a few things we only discovered later. Uh, I need to talk to Robert more about whether that's actually needed. Robert unfortunately had to go, um, go back home, so he's not here. Oh, he's actually in the queue, so Robert could uh, speak. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Um, yes, so um, uh, I'm here, so we can talk about JS Calendar Biz in this meeting. Can Let's you do it? Oh. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, go you, you go, person. Yeah. Okay. So the um, thing with JS Calendar Biz is um, that work on it, uh, which is done in the Calix working group. Um, has basically dormant um, since we've been focusing on JS Contact most of this and last year. Um, I've been looking at um, where we are with JS Calendar Biz, um, and um, I will go into more detail in the Calex meeting later this day. Um, but I would say I came to realize that none of what we have in JS Calendar Biz really should be a blocking point for. Um, for JMAP for calendars and JMAP for address books uh, and JMAP for, for tasks. I have one more remark to that spec though. Um, so we might just want to go ahead and figure out in Calyx if JS Canada Biz actually is needed. Uh, we might even go another direction with that. Yeah, I think um, the one thing I saw when I looked, in, looked at it briefly this morning that we might need is the schedule ID that we added to participants because um, we reference that in JMAP calendars, but we don't need a whole BIS document to add that. We can just, um, we could even document it in the JMAP calendars spec and then um, just add it to the registry directly from there. That would work fine. So we should talk about that um, maybe online, um, but hopefully we can find a yeah quicker solution so that we can get all of these documents done and out. Any other comments on any of those documents people want to? Ask winning. Cool. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. That's uh, we're well ahead of schedule. Less yeah. than ten minutes in, and we have already knocked over five agenda items. Yeah, go for it. Um, next up is S Mime Sender, which we do, I believe, have slides for. So with this document, um, I was pretty much done. Uh, I don't remember whether, did we have a last call? We did have a last call. Uh, Maybe. Question. Let me check. <clears throat> I think so, yeah. So anyway, um, Philip Tao from Apple suggested, oh, why don't we make it more generic? Um, because, next slide. So yeah, the current version is very simple. Is uh, it has a bunch of Boolean attributes for signing encryption, opaque signing, and controlling other things. And he said, <coughs> "Why don't we have an, an array of objects to control signing encryption, uh, as well as aspects of it?" Next slide. Oh yeah. So. Um, 
one thing that changed in 04 version is I added searches for is message encrypted, not encrypted. And next slide. So in response to Philip's request, um, I posted the working group version is on the left. It's example for the working group version is on the left. And I posted a personal draft with alternative more generic syntax. Um, hopefully you get an idea of the flavor of this. With his syntax, uh, there is an array of objects and you can actually, if you are, want to implement something like triple wrap, which is sign encrypt sign, you can do that with his proposal. You cannot currently do it with my proposal. Um, and he also requested a bit more control over, you know, which if header protection is done, like in LAMP's working group document, then a bit more control which headers are being protected. Um, the working group needs to pick, basically, between these two. What's your preference? What's your recommendation? Well, I, I'm trying to, to stay neutral. Uh, oh, OK. Next slide. I mean, the, the pros and cons are very fairly obvious, but I'm just, uh, the current version, which was my original, is simpler, but not extensible. So if we need to do more things, it, we need to add more attributes. Um, where inspired by Philip is flexible and extensible. So, Neil? Um, I'm just a thought on, if you go back a slide, um, sorry. The, cause this is kind of properties of the message object. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if it, if it like was more, this is what it is rather than this is what you should do. Um, which it could be, I feel. You know, is it you, like saying, a new operation kind of thing? Well, thinking? it's, it's, it's kind of like saying this is this message is smime signed and encrypted and then signed again mm -hmm. or something and then maybe if you were getting one you'd get the same thing back to say i verified that this is signed encrypted and signed again. i don't know is that wow. too otherwise i wonder whether it, it should be arguments an extra argument to email set rather than part of the um object because you're, you're saying okay so i, I mean Obviously, I've done the best I yeah I can think of. So but let's not concentrate of, on them. In on terms the of syntax, yeah, whether you uh, have the yeah, that's yeah. fine. Um, assuming <laughs> I always lean towards keep it as simple as possible, but obviously it has to do what people need to do. So if if that's yeah, yeah that's partially why I'm I'm kind of undecided because um, well, one as simple as easy to do, but. If we were to add more things to it, which I suspect we might, uh, then more generic syntax would be better. Um, how about something in the middle between of those? Just S mime and then one object with just the properties because the right side looks a little bit very chatty and the left side looks redundant. So if you just make S mime an object, it would be you have more flexibility to add something, but it's less chatty. Okay, let me think about this. The reason why it's an array because you can specify. In theory, you can add more transformations there. You can say compress, like in CMS and all various other things. Hi, Ken Murchison. Um, I'm not all that concerned with what the syntax looks like, but if there's use cases for chaining these together, as you've shown with the array, I'm, I'm all for going with the ext extensibility side of things. Okay. Hi, Hans-Jörg from Rodriga. Um, I'd second what Neil said. Um, so I think, um, you know, if it's not a property of the thing, but rather meant to be an operational thing, it should probably be a parameter. Um, with my migration portability hat on, I would also say there would be some glory in having that also as a property in addition. 
um, just because sometimes you have the case when you are scanning an account or something like that, and you want to know for a customer if there are encrypted messages that need to be handled specially in a portability scenario or something like that. I'm not sure if it's in scope for you, but just as a sign. Okay. So this is SMIME sender. There's already a draft or a, a published document for SMIME reception and, and being okay. able to tell if uh, it's a reception SMIME. for signed messages. Yeah. Because this also deals with decryption. Right. Uh, um, I mean, well, just a side note. So. Okay, so um, I think what I might be hearing is let's try the approach on the right, but move these two parameters of the email set as opposed to properties. And also, well, I can I can produce an example, then we can have a look. And then I think the other thing which people might or might not have said is there might be now a symmetry between how you generate these where if you find one, if you can get any information whether it's signed or not in the second proposal. So I can have a look at that as well. Yeah, if there is, it should be a property of the message. Yes. Well, um, what I'm trying to figure out is if we do the flexible approach on the right, um, on the receiving side, can you actually figure out? Well, you kind of can do a few, unpack all the transformations that were done, but uh, again, how do you express this? Um, and how? And then some, well, with things like triple wrap, if you cannot decrypt message, you don't actually know that it's a triple wrap. You can only see the signature on the outside and, and encrypted blob you cannot decrypt. So again, you know, which is legally, you can still construct on the sending side. Um, okay, so I, I think let's, uh, let's experiment a little bit more with, uh, approach on the right and so I know this was uh, sent, so we, sent to ASG in November but because of this I need a bit more work we I don't think it was I couldn't find a lot it, of it did was it well I I saw it somewhere If it wasn't for this proposal, I think I was done. But you know, now uh, I yeah, think... no. SMIME sender extensions is in working group document. It hasn't been sent. No, no, no milestone. Oh yeah, milestone was yes. Okay. Yeah, we'll update the milestone. Yeah, milestones are. are... Okay, so I'll um, I'll try to produce a new version. As up so that you know while it's still in people's minds so hopefully like mid-november or early december and we can have a look so just before we move on um i've got an action for you to do a new document i should go back and look at um so for Civ, the next action is for me to submit to ISG, oh, to because it's already been in working group last call. ISG, so I'll just do that. Uh, sharing is drawn to working group last call. And with calendars and contacts, Neil, did, you're going to do another document for those? I, I will need to do another document just with the RFC reference to it once JS calendar. Just contact. So just you can you can re you can reference the draft even as it goes to working group last call and it'll get resolved by the editors. So working group last call on yeah, on okay. both. Um, just need to check the schedule ID stuff then with Robert on the on the JS calendar. No, but yes, I think they are. Okay. Yeah, we can do working group last call fairly straight away on them and sure. yeah. yeah awesome 
All right, uh, JMAP tasks and portability is all we've got left in the JMAP. Yeah, so um, I'm Joris Baum from Odriga. Um, oh, no. Uh, yeah, so maybe can, yeah. So basically, not a lot has changed since the last ITF. Um, I still need to have, I still have all the to-dos from last time. Um, the draft is now expired and I need to sync with JMAP calendars, continue with the survey um, and finalize the folder object. Um, yeah, and I, so I will publish a new draft soon. And uh, yeah, I think as JS calendar biz is no longer a requirement, I would also agree on that point. Um, I don't see big roadblocks in the way of finalizing this. So yeah. If there are any questions, feel free, but if not, I would just continue with the next slide deck. So action for you is to publish a new version and then... Yes. Yeah. Maybe put my, my Neil's heads together and sync how like what, what else needs to be done. Um, yeah, so and I can finish this. While we're here, what kind of timeline do you expect to, to be done? I hope it would be the same as, as for JMAP calendars. So, it, so what, what, was it, what was that now? The next JMAP ITF? calendars, hopefully before next ITF, we'll, we'll publish unless, um, so did you still have to survey anything or? Are you happy that we've done enough surveying? I mean, I, I would I would broaden that a bit, but I, I don't expect it to take a long time. Cool. So I think next ITF is my, would be my goal. Cool. Um, yeah, has been there for a long time, so it's about time to finish it. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So German portability. Um, so on in Yokohama. Uh, basically, it was the first time uh, I presented this. Um, so this is a, well, at Yokohama, I presented one draft, JMA for Migration Data Portability, which included a bunch of other things in the appendix that have, that I moved out of that document into separate other small documents now. Um, yeah, so the first, the big main draft, JMA for Migration Data Portability, should be, um, uh, has undergone some revisions since Yokohama that I did uh, until ITF 117. Maybe, yeah, maybe let's, let's continue on, on the next slide. Yeah, so um, yeah, first presented ITF 116. Um, it has undergone some changes since uh, until ITF 117. Since then, nothing has changed. I didn't receive any feedback so far. So I think um, this is uh, should be ready for adoption. Um, yeah, so the, I, just as a recap, um, the idea here is to provide clear guidance on implementing essential parts of JMAP um, to reduce the, the entry barrier if you want to implement JMAP as a new protocol and uh, yeah, to have a more efficient way of imp implementing that if you don't want to, if the full JMAP spec is just too overwhelming for you. Take a look at that document. All right, um, next slide, please. Yeah, so there are three separate other specs that I split out. So basically I would uh, summarize them as maybe cool things you can do with JMAP because it's a very generic protocol. Um, so all of them also have been presented. Um, here's JMAP debug logging which extends the JMAP response with log messages that can be particularly helpful for debugging. Here's an example. So basically you just have a log attached to the message response. Uh, it's a very small spec. Feel free to read it and leave some feedback. Next slide, please. Here's JMAP backend info. Um, defines the ability to provide details about the product, backend and environment for, for JMAP servers which is basically, as it is right now, an extension to the capabilities 
uh, object in the session object. Um, yeah, where we pro where you can see oh which is which API backend am I talking to? Which product? Which environment is this? Um, as you can see in the example, also here. Feel free to leave some feedback. Next slide, please. And uh, yeah, the, the last one is JMAP REST mapping, which basically specifies a REST mapping um, for JMAP endpoints. So there are fewer requirements for certain use cases um, compared to the co conventional JMAP endpoint. Um, I didn't put an example here. So, but the basic idea is you don't need to send the JSON any longer. You can just uh, use normal REST call for your JMAP calls, which is useful in some scenarios. So, um, uh, what? Example. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, it, well, I, okay. I didn't put an example here because I already presented that the last ITFs, sorry about that. Um, so, well, okay. Um, I, I cannot draw something now on the, on the slide, but so basically, typically you, you have a JMAP call, um, that you send to a server that has a JSON in the request. And this is basically a way to, to, re to remove that dependency so you don't need to send a JSON any longer. You can just call a certain URL, um, which is basically mapped, which maps to the JSON. So that's the idea here. So in some scenarios, the requirement of sending a JSON with each call or most calls uh, is not very, is, is, is a, a bit too much maybe. So it would certainly make a, a cleaner curl command to fetch a particular item by ID rather than wrapping it in a whole using and get and all those things. So that would be, that would yeah. be the, the kind of case that I would see it as being handy for. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't put an example here because yeah, it's basically all the drafts um, have been like they are since um, actually Yokohama, ITF114. And I just want to, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, sure. Um, I'm trying to pull up the slides from the last meeting if you want that example. Oh, yeah. Also a good idea. So I'm just <laughs> now trying to ask for adoption here um, since I didn't receive much feedback since last ITFs. So please read the documents if you can and yeah i would hope that we can start an adoption call on the list so this is a request for adoption call for all three all four of them actually all four documents cool um why don't we use the tool just for just for fun since we haven't done it before um pull the room Okay, may, okay, if you want to, maybe, I don't know, is, is, does somebody need more examples before we can, because I didn't give you much info now on, uh, on that, those slides. Give options in that. Options here to start. Yes, no. Yes, no, no, yep. Can you remind us what four documents are? Maybe go to the second slide. There are the four documents. Portability. Yeah, yeah. Yes, no, no, opinion doesn't let us give options. Yes, some, or talk more. Go one back one slide. Oh, I can also do it. <clears throat> yes. So well, well, they're yes, all. If you like to them, and then so the thing is, they're they're right now as the ta task spec as well. No, nothing has changed since last ITF, so they're all expired. So you it's, you don't easily find them, I guess. Mm -hmm. They're all, uh, yeah. They're not. Yeah, they're all attached to my name right now. I think so. Yes. I can. You can't adopt expired documents. 
I know. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, I will refresh them before adoption. <laughs> yes, they're very, very small documents. So there will be definitely more content. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Makes sense. You can okay. you can specify more than one capability in a single yeah. document. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Very good point. All right, that looks pretty clear to me. Um, we'll do a call for adoption. Uh, <laughs> we'll do we'll do four calls for three calls for adoption. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we are at the section for any other business for JMAP. Does anyone have anything else? microphone thank you I, this is Hans -Jörg again just a very short note because i think i presented that last itf was a jmap archive thing so this is also something i didn't yet had the time to finally work on but also alexei already volunteered to um, help with that and i heard also in the meantime from many people that would like to see that so just an info this is still on the roadmap and something i think we will sit together soon and yeah so the jmap archives you know like how to have a file or pst file version of jmap in a way yeah thanks so that, that was a i will publish a draft that we'll go do a call for adoption for awesome thank you And now, uh, could you unshare that document, please? Thank you. Now I just have to fight with uh, this thing for a second. Milestones. So here's what we currently have. Submit Civ document to IASG. And we're expecting we'll be doing this, Ken, when when would you say? Should be good to go now. Cool. So we're looking at December 2023. Submit JMAP sharing document is likewise straight away. Adopt a draft for migration with a simplified endpoint. Now-ish. Coordinate with extra working group and potentially adopt, adopt the document for snooze. We've done that, uh, but Ken. Yeah, this is, this is Ken. I think we're gonna pull that for now. Um, at last week's uh, meeting with some email providers, it looks like we can't come to a cons consensus on what actually snooze should do or how it should operate. So we're gonna put that in the back burner for a while. So. Regardless, this was done. Are you hoping to get any of these through this year? Uh, hoping to submit this year. Yeah, to like get them past the telechats. There's only two left is all I'm thinking yeah. about. So. Um, not stressed if they okay. don't get past the telechats, just get them out, off my responsibility and that's <laughs> your problem. Anyway, that is done, even if we're not going to progress it. SMM sender's document. That's, Alexi, what do you think? Next year sometime? Yeah, realistically. Uh, was it February? February. I'm on break. Contacts is going to be submitted shortly. JMAP calendars. 
we had that as March next year, but we're going to pull that back a little bit, yeah? Okay. We'll also submit that December, hopefully. And JMAP tasks, still early next year? Yeah. All right. It's fine if I'm earlier, right? Yep. All right, so that's all the ones that were currently there. And what else do we have on our list? Just go back through the minutes here. Civ, sharing we've dealt with, contacts and calendars we've dealt with, SMM sender we've dealt with, tasks. So we've got to add um, portability and so we've done portability, we've got to add the other two. Uh, adopt document for um, GMM archive format. When do you think you'll have it written by? January next year, adopt? Yeah. yeah. Cool. And we had uh, document for server info and debug, which is due next month. Debug. Yes, you can. <clears throat> Backend info. And we had a doc a document for what was the other one again? at the top. And that was also going to be December. Change, change, change. Context didn't change. And we have those ones. That looks good. All right. Fantastic. Well done, everybody. That is... JMAP finished slightly earlier. Let's move on to the important business. <laughs> you got the slides? Oops. You need to ensure. Oh, yes. Sorry. You could probably boot me, but whichever. All right, um, hang on. I think we've bypassed an important slide. There we go. Uh, the important question, show of hands, who is coming to dinner? I see 11, 12, 13, 14 hands in this room. Uh, dietary requirements, do we need to collect those at this point? Um. The restaurant suggested that um, they just prepare mixed starters for us uh, and uh, I've sort of decided to say yes to that. Yeah. To make sure that it's not all meat because I've had enough of that. <laughs> I think that's the least one of those in the We bought 50 pieces and stuff. Oh, I also think it's sort of one of my people that I've asked about. You're watching my people. My Okay, so you probably 16. 14 in the room? 14 in the room, yes. Do you count? 17. Yes. Okay. 17 and maybe 20. Maybe. Yeah. I haven't got a confirmation. That's a confirmation. Is George here? Anyone called George? We might be 80. <laughs> okay. All right. Fine. Uh, done. Fantastic. 
Um, those people who weren't here are not true friends of email, obviously. Um, yeah. And those who couldn't make this meeting likewise are not not friends enough. They didn't make the effort. Okay. Is that how it works? Pete, Pete raised his Pete hand raised remotely. remotely. Yeah, Pete's up to yeah. Okay. Thanks, Pete. Where are you that's so much more important than us? All right. Shall, shall we move on to the extra? So the recharter. Um, the next few slides here detail the text that's currently in the recharter. I think we probably should look at that. Um, but uh, yeah, but let's, before we do that, sorry, um, on this slide here, this is the agenda for extra. As you can see, it's very, very busy. There's tons of stuff in here. Do we have any agenda bashing? Anyone who wants to add or remove anything from this? So yes, Mara, you had a thing. Uh, the X draft extra draft IETF extra JMAP access uh, is back in revised ID needed before I can send it on because the security considerations section vanished. Okay. So I've, I, that's not the same as the last call draft you have. Are those two different documents? No, it's the same one. Okay. Cool. Um, so the rechartering, let's have a look at what we've got there at the moment. So this is kind of the description of why. Um, we have a bunch of protocols we maintain and yeah, we need, we need somewhere that they are maintained ongoing. This is the text I put together, COP, IMAP4, LMTP, CIV, JMAP. Is there anything we shouldn't be maintaining here or that we should add to that? Yes, um, you can you can Q tool as well, but so the auto conflict wouldn't fit yeah. be covered by that yet. It yep. would be nice to add. That I think one. actually, if you go back to the previous slide, I may have mentioned. No, I didn't. No, no, it's maybe later I did that. Yep, yep. Cool. Um, so the the text. Now, if we go back to that previous slide, just to because that is this is this. These three slides are the complete text of the charter suggestion um, saying, yes, from time to time there's bursts of work, important to have a home. Ken. This is Ken. Uh, I noticed that JMAP for CIV is not on there um, just for, for completeness. We are doing CIV, we're, we're doing JMAP, so we've got the cross section there. The email message format isn't there. I'm speaking without a name because it, this is so embarrassing to say. <laughs> Have you considered merging extra and JMAP? Uh, potentially. JMAP's still doing a fair bit of other work at the moment, but it won't be that long before I mean, that's done. That fifth bullet sure makes me, th and the way this usually yep. gets scheduled over the last several years makes me think maybe we should just bring them together. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, let's. Yes, sorry, just comment on that. I guess the question then is, do you merge in Calyx as well? Is it because is it all? <laughs> I know. Well, I know. I'm just saying it's just like because there's as much overlap also kind of with that in the moment with JMAP. Where? Not on there with JMAP. I was saying it's oh, like JMAP contacts, JMAP calendars, just oh, you know, two wow. other things. Yeah. Uh, well, or, or perhaps split those things off of JMAP into Calyx and and move the other parts of JMAP into extra. Yeah, uh, maybe that works out the, the base stuff is done. Do you mind picking yeah. up DKIM too? I'm leaving I have a large list. All right. Um, let's have a look at the other two slides just to see what's on there. So this one's saying we'll do extensions and we will try and make them compatible because these are widely distributed things that have lot, lots of implementations out there. Um, so we need to be backwards and forwards compatible. And then the final slide says what we won't work on, which includes DKIM, DMARC, email core, U UTA, explicitly won't make changes to SNTP other than message submission and won't make changes to the MIME format. Um, this is, mostly copied from our original charter. 
with a couple of changes to uh, remove JMAP from that list of things we won't do anything with. But the won't make changes to the mine format was part of the original extra charter. If we wanted to take those on, that would be a more significant change. I don't know what our area director thinks about that. Head is shaking. Uh, we, let's talk about it. But yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I don't stand too much on queuing <clears throat> unless it becomes a problem. I'm just flagging that the SMTP submission might be an issue and some people who is not currently here will object to that. But I suppose that's part of the chartering. Yeah, the, we, JMAP has a submission process in it. So the question is whether we. So where, where does SMTP submission live then? If not, if, uh, if, if SMTP submission is excluded, where does it belong? Um, if email core makes enough progress, it might be there if we get around to it. I'm not saying we will or will not because I cannot actually say what's going to happen in email core, but I'm just, I'm just flagging this as an issue, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the the intention here is that it only covers the parts of email, of email submission that are specific to submission. So if there's something that's specific to submission that is not used, by SMTP between servers, then that would be in scope for this working group to address. Pete. Yeah, and sorry, I'm just across the street because I had stuff to do this morning. Um, so there was some talk in dispatch about the perennial, oh, I've got email stuff to do, uh, a, a particular email change. Perhaps we need a more general email dumping ground working group and i'm getting more and more on board with the idea in my head that maybe we unlimit extra a bit and say you can bring such things here i think we want to make anything that's currently in email core in uta and dkim and dmark out of scope um i think that's fine because we have standing working groups for those things but if someone comes up with a MIME extension, if someone comes up with an SMTP extension and needs a place to vet it, um, you know, we could have the working group come up with a dispatching process where it doesn't get on our agenda until, you know, X number of hoops get jumped through. But I, I'm starting to feel like, why are we being so tight about this? And maybe Murray has an opinion. Murray. Yeah, I'm looking for Okay. Ah, thank you. Yeah, that'd be Um you're not the only one to say that this week, Pete. Uh after the dispatch meeting, um, I was approached by a few people who said, Why haven't we done something like this? And the reasons were just that the ISG has talked about this before and, and it also came up that a lot of the work that couldn't find a working group was flooding toward the ISE and the ISE complained to us and said, look, you're getting, we're getting a lot of email. It feels like this is a, just a large end run, around, end run around the process. Why don't we have a standing working group for this? And the counter argument is, well, it's hard to set up a standing working group. They can go off the rails very easily. So if we can come up with a charter that it doesn't become a dumping ground for a bunch of random things. And like, it seems like there's some structure or maybe a high bar to a document adoption or, you know, your idea here, then we could come up with something that might work for this. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's, I think that's where we landed so far. So like, let's have the conversation. How and when and where will this conversation happen? What's the structure? Well, now that's a fine question. Um, uh, 
I mean, if I'm to initiate it, it would start with uh, something on the art list, or maybe uh, I'm, and I might just say to the DKIM DMARC email core, this working group, um, I'm going to start this conversation over in art. If you're interested, please come over there and let's talk about this. And then it would come to the IESG. I was going <laughs> to, I have a draft charter for something like this. It's many, it's probably a year or more old, and it's ironically called Mailman. Um, <laughs> But it was the beginning of something like this. I can dust that off and see if we can turn it into something we can all stomach. Do you have time in the next couple of days? I'd love to sit and work with you on it. One moment, please. And, and I will say, you know, when the, the reason that SIP occurred in the first place uh, uh, I'm sorry, the reason that dispatch occurred in the first place was because SIP was overwhelmed with a bunch yeah. of extension requests and they came up with a dispatching mechanism, right? Um, and, and their move was to create a separate working group to dispatch before it got into the SIP working group. But I don't see for this kind of stuff that we're going to be overwhelmed with these things. We could come up with simply a dispatching step for everyone who wants to do some work in this catch-all working group. And I wouldn't mind extra being rechartered to do that. How are we on agenda time? Can we talk about this for a few minutes now? Yes. Um, I'm a little worried about creating something called dispatch or something dispatch-like for mail, just because we're already talking about merging dispatch and sec dispatch. Um, like that can be, this, that, this could be at messy, um, but I kind of like the idea of, well, if it can't go to one of the pre existing male working groups, it can come to this. Um, and then if this group thinks this is much too big, it should have its own working group, then it can just decline it with that being the implied meaning, go talk to the ADs about, you know, finding a bigger home for this. So like not, the, not an actual dispatch thing, but something like it. Um, I, I think that that's, I think that's sellable. Um, Alexi's behind me. Yeah, this is Ken. Um, maybe this is cart before the horse question, but SMTP, would that have to be moved into WIT and stay out of art? No. No? No, no it's not a web transport type deal. Okay. Oh, yeah, it is. Sorry, Patrick. Um, so being devil's advocate here, if people start saying, you know, I want to register my fancy, fancy header field thing, do we really want to be dealing with this in the recharted extra or with or new working group? So I think. Uh, what are the rules that are standardized? No, I think you. Uh, there is permanent and provisional, and provisional doesn't actually require an RFC, but would still not be nice to have some text saying whether it is okay or not okay or what the bar is just because you know yeah i think being very clear about that bar is exactly what's been missing in the past to get something like this through so that's what we have to develop like what's the line what are we willing to tolerate what are we what are the guidelines for kicking something out that's what we need to talk about Dies and yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> wow, awful. <laughs> okay, Ben is in the queue. Just maybe a concrete um, thing to just where would it go if I wanted to add a feature to edit an email after I send it or to delete it after I send it? Where would I go for this? It's maybe a, which version group would I go? It might be, it depends what the mechanism is. Yeah. Like, user expires and supersedes head of the It probably might end up here. Uh, I, that's the kind of thing where I would say, do you, have, do you have a draft we can look at and we can figure out how, how baked is the idea or are we tackling something as a research project or how, how far into this are we? Are? Um, to answer your earlier question about when could we chat about this, yeah. one o'clock tomorrow? 
straight up to the working group chair. Yeah, I can get the ISG office if we want it. Sounds good. Yeah, I have a very concrete question, which is I have sort of two things in the hopper. One is the stalled resuscitated expires header. And the other thing is the the uh, complaint reporting thing I, I pitched at dispatch yesterday. You yeah. know, and I would it would really be nice if both of them could end up here. So I had some chance of advancing them, but it would be but again, yeah, concretely knowing one way or the other would be important. And and one other that I mentioned in the chat that in in case you're not reading it. Uh, is uh, DKG in Sec Dispatch proposed a, uh, uh, an STS-ish like thing for message signing. So that's probably going to come our direction. I think the Sec Dispatch um, uh, action on that was refer to art. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else on this um, other than the action which I have, which is Bron and Murray to work on proposed charter? I assume that's the, what you've already said, John, that's in the queue there. Uh, next document we have is the IMAP gem of access. I think there are slides for this coming up. I can do JMAP access. This is art, yes. Uh, without the slides, I've been waiting for comments from somebody not forthcoming. Let's just move it. The reason that there is no security considerations now is that I could remove pretty much all of it, but, uh, but um, accidentally I removed the remaining sentence as well. Sorry about that. Uh, debugging, I liked, but it was a magnet for misunderstandings and we shouldn't have such thing in an RFC. If people misunderstand it, it's bad even if I like it. In one of the rare cases where my arrogance loses. Uh, I believe there is a review somewhere in the IETF apparatus that is required. Um, not my problem. Uh, I would just uh, publish it. Uh, well, I see Murray smiling. <laughs> <laughs> the review might be your problem. Um, <laughs> the, the security considerations being absent is not allowed. I can't let. I can't advance it with it right. missing. Um, the if you're going to say there are no security considerations, that will usually get sec ADs going, oh, I bet I can find something. So just like maybe. No, uh, <laughs> no there, there should be a sentence. Um, there should be a sentence. Okay. I'm... Uh, the one that was there in the first revision. Okay. Okay. So I take it the action then is that you publish a new draft with the security considerations re added? Yep. This is kind of, I've, I've read, I read this last week and considered implementing it. So I will uh, make a promise to do actually do a review on the, on the list. Uh, you reviewed six months ago as well. Uh, quite usefully as I recall. Thank you. Yeah. I read it again last week. Here. Mm. All right. That was a simple one. Yeah, cool. Right. So we get to um, fun stuff. RFC 6855 contains something that no one, none of the clients that I've looked at use correctly. The clients use it incorrectly. Fixing one of the related bugs would be my job and it was a really difficult bug to fix I would prefer to fix the document if uh, if the uh, terrain won't match the map why don't we change the map is my opinion the problem is that um, 6855 says that clients should tell the server that this 
message that I'm appending uses UTF-8 addresses. Most clients don't, one does incorrectly. Again, I would say uh, if it's a magnet for misunderstanding, kill it. Uh, in this case, particularly so because most messages in the mail store will have arrived by other parts that do not have this bit. So, in a sense, it's a write only bit that uh, is used incorrectly. A uh, clear candidate for killing, I can't imagine. However, to kill it, I do need uh, a little bit more than uh, I want to. I can do an individual draft. Uh, no, I have done an individual draft that we can adopt. I could ask for last call and full standard for that, uh, whichever. But I'm not quite arrogant en enough to, to do that without hearing agreement from someone. Alexei. I, I think Pete was first. I, I'm trying to get my head around what what did the servers do in the case of I mean I, I take it what you're saying is clients aren't actually saying I'm appending UTF-8 they're just appending and it's got UTF-8 headers uh, uh, UTF-8 UTF-8 addresses in the headers right? Uh, well, clients. Um, You're saying clients are doing it wrong. What are they doing? Right. Okay. There are two varieties. Um, most clients that can append this just don't set this flag and it works. Right. Um, clients written in Python that use uh, Python imaplib set the flag if the imaplib has seen this, that the server supports that, independent of what's in the message. Ah, so, right. So, so you're getting things marked as I have UTF-8 headers and they don't, um, and you're getting things with UTF-8 headers that aren't so marked. Yeah, so headers in both and directions. The servers and the servers are doing their best to figure out what is appropriate. Well, <laughs> as far as so far, I haven't seen any server that does anything at all with the flag. They just, well, do the servers support UTF-8 addresses? A couple do, um, but... Um, don't use this particular flag. Uh, because... Go ahead, Alexi. Yeah, it, okay. So this is all big mess, isn't it? Um, the advantage of having flag is the server can invoke different parts and say, if, this, if the client says it's UTF-8, I will use the UTF-8 parser. If the client doesn't, I can reject UTF-8 use the old parser. Uh, so obviously if there is no flag, then the server will have to figure out uh, and on my memory, a lot of spam use UTF-8. So that will be a, an interesting case when the server tries to guess and then, well, if it gets wrong. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is basically. Um not relevant. Uh, spam arrives via LMTP, not via IMAP. People don't... I, I'm sure spammers would love to just use IMAP append to upload spam into people's no, no. inboxes. <laughs> yeah, outgoing. Um, Could, could you do the side conversation at the mic so I can hear yeah. So uh, Hans Jörg was saying that uh, some IMAP servers do unspeakable things which we all want to pretend not having heard about. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good summary. Daniel. 
Hi, this is Daniel. Um, I think all of the IMAP UTF-8 is a big mess because I, uh, email in general is supposed to be seven bit clean and this is already a mess having non seven bit clean stuff in headers and the append yep. doesn't really, like if you're a client, you just have a message. You don't, you just append it. The code right. that appends it usually doesn't, it's just a blob and you upload it. You don't really know if there are UTF-8 messages in the header or not. It's like the code uploading it is just uploading it. Yep. So I don't think this makes any sense, um, even less so because all of the UTF-8 stuff is weird already. So this just adds more confusing, confusion to something that's already super confusing. So that'd be all for killing it. I don't think we would ever support this flag or set it to the correct value. Um, you have identified very precisely why it was difficult to fix these bugs. Layer problems, the, people, the code that uploads is not code that knows what's in the message. Yes, John Levine, it seems to me that when you upload the message, the server looks at the header, and if, if there are high bits set in, in any any byte in the header, that it's an AI message, and if there aren't, no. then it isn't. Uh, no. Um, this flag concerns only 8-bit or UTF-8 in addresses, well, in local parts or domains in address fields in the heading. It has nothing to do with UTF-8 elsewhere in the heading. Um, <laughs> really? Because I mean, right. maybe, because like we, we packaged it all together. I mean, you can have you know you can have unencoded UTF-8 and all of the headers in an oh, AI message. Yeah. 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 That's that. That's the other thing we changed. Yeah. I mean, when I when I hacked this into QMail, that's 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 basically what I did, and so far it seems to work. Yeah. I mean, it's a really simple test. Like, if there's a higher bit set, that it's that it's an AI message. You know, and and so this is sort of a kick me thing. Like, uh, well, did I guess right? Uh, well, okay, or what did I get right? It's yeah, difficult. Yeah, no, but I, I completely this 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 flag this flag is useless because the the server needs to look at the message to see whether the flag is right, and by the time it does that, it doesn't need the flag. Hmm. Yeah. This is kind of, kind of to John's point. So the clients you've seen not use this flag are they appending with the literal eight syntax or just using a plain old literal? Oh, difficult question. The clients have seen uh, will const con will construct the IMAP command without the flag and then go and uh, look at the blob that is to be uploaded and either use literal eight or not, depending on what that is. Okay, so so if, if there is a null they are using little eight, little eight, literal eight. Is that? They have to. Yeah, they have to. Okay. No wait. No, it, it literally. If if memory serves, literal eight starts with a tilde, right before the um, brace, something like yeah. that. Literally, I, was, I don't was, remember. I was mostly just curious because if, yep. if they are always using that, then the flag is kind of redundant to begin with. It, it, it is redundant. That's my agreement. That's my opinion as well. Now, the the clients that I've seen that construct this um, construct a command on this line of code, and slightly further down, they append an argument in the usual manner using code in another function. So my understanding was that the reason this was put in in the first place was because if you got something that was UTF-8 and then you were dealing with a client that did not understand EAI, that you would then have to hand the client something where you got rid of this crap in the address headers. Now, if servers don't do that, if servers are just passing these things blindly, and then you're going to end up with undeliverable addresses, well, we are where we are. I, I mean, the, the issue I have with Daniel's comment is, it sounds like what Daniel's saying is, 
I don't want to implement EAI because EAI has some work to do once you deal with these things for deliverability purposes. Once this message goes to something to reply, once it ends up in SMTP, it's going to be a mess. So the reason you were marking these was because the server was going to have to deal with communicating with the client that if you're going to do a reply, if you're going to, you know, do something with that address, add it to an address book, you have to know that this is an EAI address. So our, if you're implementing EAI, tell me why we can avoid using this flag. If you're saying, I'm ignoring EAI and making believe it's not there as an IMAP server, well, you can do whatever the heck you want, but then you're not supporting EAI. So I don't understand the problem. I don't really understand the bug that you were trying to fix. Um, Daniel, Daniel first. Yeah, Daniel again. So the, if you support, or it doesn't really matter if you support EAI, the e most of the emails, as was noted earlier, arrive through SMTP. And if there are emails with UTF-8 addresses in the headers, they will have arrived by SMTP. So as a client, you sort of have to support it anyway. I mean, if you don't support it, it's going to break anyway. So the append UTF-8 doesn't really help because that's sort of either the client or another client for the same account also uploading something, but you're going to see these emails come in through SMTP. So the client then telling the server, hey, I'm uploading this thing and I know what EAI is and this email has an EAI address, it doesn't really help anything. You, you'll have to solve that problem anyway and hopefully most clients do. But the append UTF-8 is just weird. Mm -hmm. Like if you have an email that's not 7-bit clean, you're going to have to do the append literal eight thing or whatever it was called. Anyway, so the fact that you're then saying, oh, by the way, this email that's not seven bit clean also has some email addresses that are not seven bit clean. It doesn't really matter. You're gonna receive those anyway and have to, you'll have to be dealing with them. And if they arrive through a pen or SMTP or whatever, it just, the main thing here is it's it's another bit that you can set or not set, and you're most likely going to set it to the wrong value. So the if you set this bit, the server can use that bit when it checks that email. But once it's on the email server, other clients are not going to see that bit when they pull down that message. So it, it's I don't see any point in this. We're, we're going to need to close the queue on this topic pretty soon. So if you have other things you want to say about it, please join now. Um, ben Buchs, um everything that Daniel said. <laughs> um, Alexi, can I maybe say something which I might or might not have heard, but might help? I think... What Daniel was saying probably is that if you get a message which is AI message, um, it's either arrived through SMTP with the AI extension, but it might, um, the client might not be the one that actually handled it in the first place. So if it's, it is forced to convert it to ASCII, the seven bit ASCII, it doesn't actually know how to convert it anyway. It might not be the one who got the message in the first place. And it's unlike, well, unless you can generate a draft message, but that's probably less likely the case. So at this point, um, yeah, we're getting in a little bit into garbage in, garbage out kind of uh, territory as well. Uh, can I suggest maybe having a lunch discussion about this? Perfect. Okay. Today. Yes, I, I, I've, I've got one thing right after this session and then uh, we can meet for lunch. Perfect. Uh, All right, so the, the next steps here are lunch discussion and then potentially a call for adoption. 
um, next steps in lunch discussion, then I'll send email to the extra list, suggesting something. Cool. Potentially equal for those. I'm probably on the wrong slide here, right? <laughs> Uh, a couple more here. Yep. Ooh. Ben likes pass keys. Um, show of hands, how many people here are happy with OAuth 2 as used in SASL and interoperability for that? I see no hands. I don't raise mine either. Yes, mine <laughs> Right. So I like pass keys, and I think, um, more to the point, Apple and Google like pass keys and are pushing it. Assuming that IMAP stays alive, which seems safe at this time, we should, we should have uh, either pass key support or some sort of pass key bridge. And that's squarely our that's this working group. <coughs> Isn't it? OK, um, if not, then I would uh, like to discuss no, no, like, where. If you want to hop up, so I've yep. got a queue. If you want, yeah, cool, Daniel. So that's what I had to say, really. Um, Daniel again. Um, pass keys are nice. One of the problems with this is that, and this is a bit hand wavy, uh, but Generally speaking, pass keys are tied to, or often tied to biometric authentication. And usually you want your IMAP thing to just kind of run in the background, fetch things, even though the user isn't staring into their screen. And if IMAP uses pass keys, then you can't do that because no. the user might not mm -hmm. sort of actively be using. So this is one of the things to be aware of here. Um, if, if you want to open a connection to the server while the user isn't actively using, that might not work. Like it may be a bit outside the scope. I'm just saying that that is mm, one thing. Yeah, well, the, Some implementations. So, Generally, for example, you know, if you have a UB key, you might have to sort of touch the UB key thing, and so the <laughs> IMAP yep. client might not be able to open a connection because the user would have to every time you open a connection might have to touch the UB key. Mm, There's yes, user no, presence yes, no. and user verification there. Yeah. So, so uh, that that's like passkey is super interesting because OAuth has its issues, but passkeys also have their issues when implementing this. If uh, may I? Um, pass keys on the web are typically used to set a cookie with a short expiry, so you have to re-authenticate every four hours, something like that. I would want to do something like that for SASL as well. So you get a four-hour token, two-hour token, one-day token, something like that. That solves the problem with wanting to check email in the background. It also solves the extremely similar problem with user uh, changing from um, mobile data to wire to WLAN. Um, can't ask the user to touch the phone just because of that. Or changing from the IETF hotel network to IETF network. I mean, some sort of token like that must be there. This is Neil. Um, I mean, pass keys are great. I love pass keys. The way to make this work is with, with OAuth. That's the way we're going to get like um, widespread um, adoption. I don't think putting this directly into IMAP makes sense. Um, they're tied to a domain. You'd have to exchange it for a token anyway and use the token. Like generally, you know, this is the kind of stuff that's already defined. You know, I don't love OAuth in, like everyone else, but I think it is the right solution here. I've um, been talking with a lot of other um, email vendors about a way of making this happen in a way that everyone can use OAuth without having to pre-register everyone between everyone else. And I think we can make that work because um, people want to use the uh, web login for like for the actual login process, which gets you pass keys, but also gets you a lot of other things that can be nice in terms of the, there's, you know, people have got a lot of analysis of uh, what's happening with logins to help them um, track uh, popped accounts and, and the rest of that. So I don't think putting this directly into IMAP is the right solution. Mm. 
Yeah, well, obviously not into IMAP. Uh, a SASL document um, is what it would be. Coincidentally, that's the topic we were talking about last week, which non-interactive uh, authentication. Um, yes, but there are ways to do, solve this. Um, I think this is the wrong working group for this. I think this is very much in scope for the kitten working group. Kitten working group. And there are... Hmm? You're talking to a chair? <laughs> <laughs> I should know. Um, there are some documents which are not adopted that was discussed in Kitten, which is very much aligned with this. Um, so I think I would like to have this discussion. And Sassel Auth is also in scope for it, so it, it, it's fine. But I think um, once we have the discussion, I don't think it, it belongs to this working group, basically. Hi, uh, Jim Fenton. Um, you know, pass keys have all, are getting a lot of press right now. They're, uh, they seem to be very, very promising, especially for consumer facing applications. But they're just an example of one of many authentication techniques that I think we need to have better supported in email clients in general. Um, you know, in, in some enterprise use cases, you might want to have better support for smart cards. And it's it's kind of the kind of the same um, uh, the same thing. So I think specifically calling out pass keys for IMAP is is probably a little too specific. Uh, I think kind of better support, generalized support for multi-factor authentication into email is really needed. Yeah. Agree. I'm, I'm aware of the time we are pretty tight. So we should, okay. We should keep moving. Um, uh, suggestion then is move this to kitten. And uh, look at uh, how to uh, uh, be a bit more general, uh, in particular support both pass keys and smart cards. Right? Okay, fine. Thank you. Was that the last of mine? Uh, ben, did you have a, one more? Since it was in the queue. I'll try to be brief because OAuth is a whole talk on its own, OAuth and mail, but just about the uh, expiration date. So if I want to check mail, I want the expiration date to be about 12 months, not four hours, because I want to keep my email keeping checking. So that's also what I would do. I would do pass keys and a token, which lasts for 12 months. And uh, that maybe only works for mail check. And then if I want to actually read the mail, I get another token or something like that. Your enterprise might disagree with the 12 months, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, what have we not addressed that we well, skipped over in all of this? Have I, that last I'm at, that's the last I'm at one. You idea on the, okay, Sorry, I think I, Alexa has got a bunch of your stuff here. I, I didn't, um, know, when, I didn't know when to change. We <laughs> have, I, did, I had to go first way. We have IMAP UID only, SIV process IMAP, IMAP list metadata, IMAP in progress, and IMAP message limit in the existing draft section. So, Alexi, what would you like to do? So, UID only, um, there was one small update since last ITF, adding response code saying, oh, you should command, which didn't include UIDs, you know, UID required or something like that, just to help with um, error reporting. I'm a few ideas. Uh, I don't have slides. I, have slides. I think it's, uh, and the document are now experimental because we want to get a bit more experience with, uh, with this. Other than that, the document is done. So I think working group last call, please, if, if we can. Uh, this is Ken Alexi. Don't forget the issue that I brought up uh at the reception about what happens if the client only asks for UID. It's, it's a kind of a silly, it's a silly use case because it's, oh, yeah, it's, it's pointless for okay. the client. Well, what should the, should the server reject it or okay. just return nothing? Are you happy for this to be last call comment? Sure. Oh, fine. It, it's a small syntactic thing that uh, I'm happy. Yeah, I agree. Sorry, I forgot, but I agree this needs to be uh, handled.
Uh, do you have, Alexi, you have other drafts? Do you want to stay up and work through the rest? Okay. Shall we do message? Mes message limit, I assume? Sure. All right, next slide. <coughs> yeah, we can skip that. Next slide. So based off on various feedback, there were a few things done, uh, mostly clarifications. Um, there is a separate capability save limit if the server only enforces this on copy and append, um, as per Timothy Reinen. Um, adding a lower limit so that the server cannot say you are only allowed to ever like fetch or modify one single message. That would be a bit silly, I think. Um, and then um, there was update to clarify that certain commands are exempt from message limit. Otherwise, it makes it very difficult for clients to actually do anything about. So these commands are expunge, close, and status. Um, in particular, for close, if the client is trying to close mailbox, and then it, uh, if we were to enforce message limit, um, the server then says, oh, sorry, I cannot close the mailbox. You, ha you have to call it multiple times. That just kind of becomes very silly. So um, that's why it's exempt. Um, and then there is also a section describing the effect of this extension on clients that don't understand it. So kind of to spell it out what the side effects are. Um, and then the document was changed from proposed standard to experimental because I think we need to play a bit more, more with it and just get experience about how, how useful it is in the real world. But I think it's done. And I'm sorry, um, so I discovered yesterday that I forgot to clarify how that search wasn't behaving. One of the sections described how search was behaving with message limit and the other one didn't match it, so I fixed it basically. As far as I'm concerned, I think it's done. I put myself in the queue on this one. I just wanted to comment on the 1,000 limit. Um, when I was writing, when I'm writing test cases, I almost certainly want to configure the server to have a message limit of about 10, so that I don't need to shove a thousand messages into my test just to test it. I'm not sure why you need that there. You can certainly say servers should, public servers should have this limit, but I think having a must. I think a it's minimum. a should. I think it's a should actually. Yeah. But I agree with you as far as testing, but. I just worried about servers saying, well, I'm going to put a limit of like two messages or one message and that's not, Yeah, that's going to be super inefficient for everybody and. No production server in the real world is going to do that without a users complaining. So I don't think it's a real risk. Well, most clients wouldn't support it. So users will complain, you know, I don't know. So are you suggesting no limit or are you okay with should? Uh, I'm okay with the should. Okay. Yeah. All right, Barry. What I was trying to signal to you. Ah, that, that's what that meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I pointed to the slides and I made it. This is Barry. Uh, I just wanted to say that I had some comments on this previously and these, particularly the last three bullets, um, address my comments, so I'm good with where you are. Okay, good. Okay, so what's next step here? I think working group last call, if we didn't have one. Cool. Um, and you, Braun, as individual, can double check whether the text around the limit is fine. Yeah. I'll and if you. not, we'll take it as a last call comment, I assume. And, yep. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. Cool. Um, we have IMAP in progress as well. Is that? Uh, and we have. Hello. Yep. Hello.
Um, the document, has, no, there is no slide uh, to share. Uh, the document uh, hasn't had changes since the last meeting, since all the stuff that has been raised has been, I hope, addressed. And if I understand well, Bron, we are in last call now. We're uh, in so you last call now, yes. Okay. Uh, this is IMAP in progress. It's in working group last call from the start of last week. Working group last call ends on Friday of this week. So, um, yeah. And um, the, on, the only thing that I'd like to mention again is that uh, the document as it is uh, gives a model where you, the goal is to say to the client, hey, I have this stuff to do and this is the point where I am. So it gives a, a goal and a progress, which if you put them together can be derived to be a percentage or whatever you want. And uh, there are provisions that uh, if some piece of information is not available, we can give degraded information. So for example, if you don't know the the point we we need to reach because it's iterative. We can simply send, send hey, I, I've, I've gone this far, so I processed n elements, but I don't know when, when I will finish. Or uh, it can uh, give uh, a degraded information like uh, a percentage. So I don't know exactly which is the goal and how many did, but maybe I am. 30% of what I'm, do I'm doing. And the idea uh, with that was that uh, if you have uh, a non-degraded information, you can use it better. For example, if you have multiple operations going on different connections or different folders or whatever, you can put uh, all the goals together and all the progress together and give uh, a consolidated percentage, which just summing percentages from different operations doesn't work. Um, internally in the company, there was debate if to provide just the percentage and nothing else. Personally, I, I think trying to provide more quality information is better, but that was an argument I already asked a couple of times in different meetings to for comments about that. Uh, so this is uh, my last uh, invite for opinions on that. Even that my position is, I prefer to give more fine-grained uh, information, but I understand the other side too. Popping myself in the queue because I commented on this one. Um, I I think simplest is best. So just having a account and a total is enough. I think having this separate percentage symbol in the syntax complexifies things for clients and is unnecessary. That it should just be should just be two numbers, one that has to be lower or same. Well, basically lower than the other because once it's the same, you're done, and that's it. So you are against the percent symbol in the syntax in the statute? Yeah, I'm against the percent symbol. Yeah. I think it's an additional complexity that doesn't a client's not going to display anything different. It'll just show no. progress. Well, the the reason for that, uh, uh, I know it's a complication, but it is because without that, you don't know. If you go to one under these actual items or a degraded percentage, so it was a, a way to convey the information that the information is not in the in its entire form, but it's already degraded. So that was the idea. But I understand your point. Yeah, I, th I don't think a client so a client will display it any differently. It'll display display a progress bar either way, whether it's a percentage or there's exactly a hundred items. Um, anyone else have last call comments here? I mean, you can comment on the mailing list too, but. I guess not. I'll uh, push the buttons on Friday then. For, uh, no, you'll need to do um, an updated draft based on whatever last call comments and then we, then we submit to ASG unless anyone objects. Cool, Alexi. So next section for me to drop the percentage yeah. sign. Yeah. I will, and potentially whatever comes later. Oh, sorry. 
that's not the objection. I, I read the draft and I was even happy with percent, but yeah, no, I, like if it's yeah, I'm I'm not. That's fine. I, 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 I don't, don't mind. I don't want to block her on it, but I think it's just exce excessive complexity. Okay, um, I think, Ken, we have Civ Process IMIP and less metadata. Oh, we've got 25 minutes, and the only thing after that is um, auto config and big files. Okay, well, those are important, so we'll, we'll try to move some, some quicker here. So, do you have slides? Yes. Uh, no. That's called Civ Calendar. Yep. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Uh, as you recall, before last ITF, um, the name of this was changed from Process IMIP to Process Calendar. So, because it's, we can also now support um, public messages, but um, the review that came in. Um, reminded me that I'd forgot about the method publish, which is also used for public messages. It just, uh, because there's no attendee in the, in the calendar data. So I renamed the non ITIP uh, argument to allow public, which is pretty straightforward. Um, also renamed delete canceled uh, with one L to two Ls, which now matches the language in 5545. Um, and I added a new section that talk, talks about interaction with other actions. Uh, the draft already talked about uh, not canceling implicit keep, but I also talked about uh, reject and that this should only be executed once per, per script. Next slide, please. Uh, also at a security section, um, I referenced a CalConnect specification that talks about calendar spam, but I also um, singled out these three particular issues. Um, this section definitely needs more review so please read the draft and let me know if there's anything missing or incorrect or needs to be fleshed out more next slide please um, other changes based on feedback um, this should not touch the recipient's participants participation status at all um, some clarifications on the error string added uh, this to the the action registry which i'd forgotten to do previously even though i'm co-author on that specification um, and added some open issues, which uh, I will talk about shortly. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the updated syntax. The stuff in green um, is only used if the server also supports variables, uh, but that's spelled out in the spec. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, so open issues. Um, based on feedback is, should we talk at all about what the server should do or the SID engine should do if there are multiple parts with calendar data. Um, Neil. Yeah, it's Neil. Um, I mean, we, yes. Uh, I would say, um, based on what we've seen, you know, having done this, if there are multiple parts, but they're all actually representations of the same calendar data, and you check the UID and stuff, and normally they are all identical, yeah, just pick it's, one, it's process it. If you have more than one and they're different, you shouldn't process any of them. That's someone sending like their whole calendar they've exported from somewhere as a file. You probably don't want to automatically do report, that. That would be my report suggestion. Report that as an error or just no action? Whatever, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about, imagine multi-part digest, which is the archive of a mailing list or, you know, conversation. So it's like, there is no point in processing them. Okay, maybe. so. But if... absolutely spell it out in the document. Okay. Fair enough. Next yeah, I mean, slide. you could have multi parts or just a single iCalendar file with multiple events in it because that's allowed to. Either way, I don't think you want to automatically process it. So basically, what we're saying is if. Two separate things, wait, wait, you do that. Yeah, so if, they're, if they're, they differ, ignore them. If you've got raw iCalendar and base64 encoded, but it's the same, proceed as, as usual. Yes, obviously. Okay. Um, 
Uh, another question: Should we discuss inline attachments in relation to possibly having, you know, carrying viruses and all kinds of other stuff? Do we? Do you mean return? inline inside the calendar data? Inside the calendar data. And are they like base sixty four? You mean by inline, or it's not not just like a URL somewhere? Base sixty four inline. You know, do we just give a long discussion about what to, you know, scan it, all that other stuff, or just mention put it in, in the security, security considerations? Section? Yeah. Just put it in security. Okay, fine. Um, last point, um, which came up uh, as I was, was re-implementing some of this stuff, Alexi's got the ex uh, external lists um, extension, and I was wondering if would it be useful to leverage that and specify a list of addresses that you will only accept invitations from if they are the organizer. Currently, there's no there's no way to to match or, or tell this action, these are the organizers that really want to accept stuff from. You can check the headers, but the headers don't have to match what's in the calendar data. They don't. They normally do. Like normally the from address will be sufficient. Normally, that. but you don't you don't have to. So just just a question. I, I'm not advocating strongly for this or pushing it. Just a question if people okay. think it might be useful. Make it optional. But obviously it would have to be optional if, if the extended list is already supported. Okay. I'll flesh out some text and see if uh, if it becomes useful. Um, I don't, what's the next slide, Jim? I'm not even sure. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this? But again, please read the security sections. Let me know where it's lacking. I'm sure it is. Okay. Um, on to list metadata. So I've got two actions for that. Ken to revise it and everyone to review, particularly the security considerations. Is everyone in the room? If you're a friend of email, um, come to dinner. Review the document. Okay, uh, list metadata. This is very, very short. Next slide, please. So uh, just a review of what this is. This basically mirrors what Alexi did with list status and what Brian and I did with list metadata, or excuse me, with uh, list my rights. Um, it's just a way to, to fetch annotations on mailboxes as part of list. Um, for instance, color or you know any other display kind of keys. Um, I th it's it's the spec or the draft itself was basically a, a carbon copy of my rights, ch just changing the appropriate language. So I, th I think it's, uh, it's fairly well baked at this point. Um, and I think the next slide just asks if we want to move this to last call, if there's no other issues or comments or questions. Yeah. Assuming I didn't make any, assuming I didn't make any cut and paste errors and didn't change any required language. I think I can find those in the last call. Exactly. Okay, so we'll take that to last call next week, possibly. Cool. Whatever. All right, thank you. All right, um, on to the new, new stuff. We have uh, auto config. Hi, I'm Ben Buksch. Um, for the slides, um, we have, do you, Bron, did you get my email? C could you just when share was, When was that? Uh, this morning. Just Okay. Um, if, it, if you, it's just a few URLs that you just need to uh, that you need to open. Totally <laughs> <laughs> There's no virus in the MP4. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was just just. <laughs> if if Bron yeah. is okay, then or, I can, or you can, I do, can do, it. do that. Share screen. Easy, he's already connected. Thanks. Um, yeah, can you just open the first one? Open the first link there. So. <laughs> Boom. So that's auto, auto config. Uh, what did you not see here? What did not happen? Uh, we did not select whether this is a Google account or Yahoo account or a Microsoft account. There was no button to select the provider. Uh, he just entered his email address, his name, and his password. Um, when this was first implemented 15 years ago, uh, the state of the art was you would enter your IMAP host name, your SMTP host name, your authentication method, um, and uh, your username, 
uh, you need to know whether it's admin or admin at ward.com or is it admin slash slash ward dot or something like this. Um, so this is all figured out automatically. Uh, board numbers, obviously. Is it SSL? Start is it not? TLS. Is it star TLS or TLS or uh, not? Okay. Or yeah. yeah, you get the point. Good. Um, so how does this work? <laughs> uh, can you open the second URL, please? So this this is the proposed format. Um, if you say yikes to XML, uh, there were reasons. <laughs> But uh, what you see here, this is the configuration for one ISP. Uh, in this case, Yahoo. You s there's a few of the domains listed. Those are not, uh, which are not listed here are covered in a different way. Uh, way. I'll come to that. Um, if you scroll down a little bit to the first incoming server. Um, and here is the configura configuration being listed. Um, there's multiple incoming servers that you can list. Uh, they're listed in the order of priority. The first one is the preferred one, um, but the configuration file captures all working and sensible configurations. So um, we try very hard to get a configuration with STLS enabled, um, but if there is an ISP which absolutely doesn't support that anymore, we still list in plain, but otherwise we try really hard. Yahoo was a funny case because they said, no, we don't support SSL, but they actually did, so just, we just put in the SSL config. Um, and this complaint about it, we said, no, we don't care. Uh, we do SSL. <laughs> um, if there's multiple IMAP ports, uh, for example, IMAP might be running on 140, 143 with star TLS and 993 with TLS directly. We're listing both, and we're typically preferring the direct SSL one, but we're listing all working sensible configurations. So if for some reason the first one drops out, you cannot connect to it, you can still fall back to the other one. Um, and the selection between IMAP and POP3 is a selection that you can allow the user to make. Uh, in Thunderbird, you can actually choose whether you want to do as IMAP or, as, uh, or POP3. Sorry, did I say SMTP? Um, you can the user can choose between IMAP and POP3, but that's a user and agent choice then. Uh, obviously, list SMTP as well. And um, you don't see that here, but uh, we can also include calendar synchronization and contact synchronization. We can include web dev for file sharing for big files, for example, um, so that um, I just said I, I ten, have one configuration and I'm set to go with email, contacts, calendar, uh, uh, file synchronization, everything. Um, we capture the uh, documentation where the author, authoritative common documentation where we got this from and uh, the um, OAuth configuration. So if you want to do OAuth, uh, you can get the information right there and you don't need to hard code um, the parameters how to do OAuth. That assumes that there's no going to be client registration things. So that's a discussion to be had later on. OAuth as is simply does not work for email um, because it's re OAuth spec requires client registration, which obviously doesn't scale. So that's a conversation that needs to happen before we can actually deploy this. Um, but this is a too long discussion. It doesn't fit in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So um, can you go to the um, next one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's the Quick. draft. Um, I will very quickly go over the methods that we use to get this configuration because there's several income sources for that information. So the first, um, oh, by the way, yes. Uh, I got a little bit lost. Um, if you scroll down a little bit. So this is implemented by a number of clients already. And um, scroll down over this. This is just an XML file. You can scroll down uh, just with comments with the different options. So stop here. Thank you. Um, a little bit higher again. Yeah. Um, if you go to 4.1. Thank you. So uh, there's different sources for this information um, because email is a decentralized federal federated medium. Uh, we, are, we want to keep that idea. So the first attempt that we're making is to directly contact the ISP on a well-known URL. Uh, there's two, uh, one with a specific host name 
and um, that would be useful. The first one would be useful if you're an ISP and you want to have this configuration secure on a separate server, or if you're a small do domain and you don't want to bother setting up your own host for that, you could just dump a single XML file in a well-known URL on your normal website and uh, we can fetch that too. That's the two options there. The third one is there um, because um, of hosters, we need to do a redirect. That's doesn't that explanation for that doesn't fit in five minutes, so I'll skip over that. Um, can you go down to 4.2? Yeah, there's, there's certainly some stuff around the use of must language there that I'm sure is going to get discussed later because right. musts are about what the client does, not about <laughs> how do you enforce that kind of must. It's not that, that's not, but anyway, yep. Um, yes, about the schmutz and shoulds is, but I want this must over there is there so that to avoid that the ISP says, no, I don't want to support that. And you're just going to break you deliberately and stuff like that. Um, so the mo most ISPs don't have this configuration on the well-known URLs. Uh, so I was thinking, how do we support Google, Microsoft, all those? Uh, the solution was a central database, uh, the ISP database, uh, which I maintain. And it has a list of pre almost all ISPs in the world with a market <laughs> share more than 0 0.1 market share. Um, so it's pretty much everything in there. And um, this, if the ISP itself doesn't have it, you can most likely, and it's an ISP, you most likely find the configuration in there. Um, that feels a little bit yucky in a federated environment, but uh, it was a way to get over 50% of working configurations right off the bat. It was crucial for making this work. Um, next point would be MX lookup. That is helping hosters. For example, I have an Exchange 356. No. <laughs> Microsoft, whatever. Um, there, I don't have the configuration for all of their customers. So I'm making an MX lookup to find the MX server. From that, I find the hoster. And then I look up the hoster um, with the, uh, some of the other methods and find the configuration this way. That helps increasing the hit rate dramatically as well. That's mostly the methods. And then the Maya client can do some other things as well. That's more or less the basic mechanism. Um, this is already uh, implemented by many of the open source clients, pretty much all of them that I know. Uh, Nextcloud, email, a K contact, Kmail, uh, K9mails implementing it, Fairmail is implementing it. Uh, pretty much all the open source clients that I was thinking of are implementing this already to, sm to more or less degree. And um, we discussed that at MOAC. There was an overwhelming um, support for this. this pe most people responded, can you do that next week? And they wanted that right away. Um, so there is a draft specification for that up. Um, the, the, proposed, the approach that I would propose and that we had discussed was that we standardize already what we have right now, what is deployed in the world, what clients are implementing right now to make it RFC for that, to document this. Yeah, this has been the informational RFC. Mm -hmm. Sorry? This would be the informational RFC, just describing what's mm -hmm. there. Um, and that would be for standards. Is that informational? Is yeah. So informational it's an RFC number, but it isn't, it's not a... St proposed standard it is a informational document describing what's there a proposed standard requires the working group to be allowed to make changes to it which it doesn't make sense for a deployed well there's small changes possible but uh, but um so first document what we have and the idea was to standardize that and then make a version two of the document and say, okay, then we open it up and we say, okay, we may do that JSON and rename SSL to TLS and, and whatever you have and want to do there. That would be the proposed approach. All right, we've got a queue of people. So let's, let's. The uh, Jim Fenton here, uh, the XML that you showed, you mentioned it, you know, included configuration for calendars and things like that. Is there an option for a user to use only portions of that? If I wanted to host my calendar 
someplace else besides at my mail uh, provider? Yes, that is a user agent configuration option. So you go through the dialogue and by default, you get everything, but you can uncheck it. Great, thank you. Um, okay, that's Neil. Uh, firstly, we definitely need an auto config kind of document kind of like this. Um, we had a meeting last week with a lot of email vendors and we were looking at making the whole flow work really well, including getting OAuth between any provider without having to pre-register all that stuff. And so the, and the first thing you need is this. The actual, in terms of what we should put into an RFC, I think there's quite a few changes you need to make. Like there's the, all the different places you look for it. That's interesting that Thunderbird does that. I don't think that belongs in the RFC. Um, I think, you know, we should say you do just one or two things and certainly like any turn, internal database and stuff is not relevant. Uh, for this. There's security considerations of guessing URLs. It's really critical to the security of all of this, like what things you discover, because you're about to send the username and password, or potentially password if, you know, if you're using basic auth, to this random address that you found. So Sorry, I would say... I, I didn't follow with the guessing because no, there's no guessing. In the yeah, yeah well, so you, you had all sorts of templated stuff, like, I'm going to look at this subdomain of this. There's no guarantee the subdomain of that domain is controlled by the same entity as, as the, you know, as the top level domain, like there's, you know, people host various delegations. It's no, maybe not. But if it's something we're going to kind of like try and recommend to people, we should say, you just do it this way. Like I would say that well-known path at the same domain as the address is okay. And otherwise a DNS serve record that says do that, but at this other domain instead, which makes it easy if you're hosting lots of domains for other people is the two mechanisms that we really want and everything else should be scrapped. Um, like, you know, Thunderbird may ch still choose to do it if you want. That's obviously up to the client, but it shouldn't belong in a like recommended document. Um, the XML bit, I haven't looked at in detail, but if it can contain all the information, fine. There's certainly an advantage of having implemented, uh, you know, already rather than having to define something new. I'm not sure about this idea of we would do a version two so that changes. I have difficulty yep. following you. Can you speak a little bit? Sorry, Thank yes. Um, I'm not sure about this idea of doing a version two later that's completely different because would people implement that you know the advantage I, I kind of feel if we can do it once that's gonna be better otherwise you end up immediately in a situation where there's two different competing things and does everyone implement both or or what like I, I'm just not sure about that approach um, but it, you know if this is widely enough implemented and it does do what we need then maybe we just stick with that format but certainly the I think there needs to be quite a lot of changes about how you find it. Um, and yeah, we we'll have to look at whether the format supports all the things that, that is needed. Um, so there was a lot in this. So yeah. let me to re respond particularly to the how to find it. Mm. And that's really core to the mechanism. So this this obviously two parts of this. This is the data format specification. Yep. And then how do I get that? Absolutely. And the how do I get that is part of the protocol, right? That is how to get that is very important. What I'm saying is the big long list of what's there, I don't think is what we should be recommending. Like that may be what Thunderbird does now, but we can firstly reduce it. So it's there's a very clear recommendation of this is how you host it. And secondly, be very careful in terms of the security implications of that. There, well, firstly, I don't think those are the right ones, and it's missing a DNS serve version to get to it. Um, the well-known one was fine, but then should be a, 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 yeah, a DNS serve way to get to the domain for the well-known as the secondary option. But okay. there was also actually a whole load of other sections about, and then you try this subdomain. We, we, need, to, this. we need to take this offline. We've got yeah, about two minutes left. Time. Um, Neil, are you, do you, I guess, as the person who most comes on this, should we adopt it and then work on it? Yeah. Cool. So we don't need a document like yep. this. So yep. Oh yeah, Alexi, you're next. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I understood that. This oh, is over. No, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Well, that's an interesting. So uh, when we talked earlier about this, I was also, you know, document what Thunderbird and others are doing. It's a good idea anyway. Uh, I don't know whether you know deciding to have informational and then. Uh, standard truck version of it, even if it's mostly the same format, but the, you know, slightly cleaner. Um, it's an option, but I think it's something to keep in mind. Yeah. Well, it if, depends if, on the slightly, yeah? if it's very, if like, if you change a JSON, then it makes sense to make a different one. 
right. But even if we decide that it's, you know, it's still XML and we just clarify that certain fields are extensible and we reduce the number of where it can be hosted. I don't know. That, that would be fine, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, yeah, we need, we need to have a think whether it's uh, one document uh, going directly to propose standard, uh, what the, how many changes, you know, what kind of changes we can do or whether it's going to be two stages as, as discussed. So I would say if it's compatible with the existing deployments, it would be fine to make changes. Um, Hans Jörg, uh, auto discovery enthusiast. Um, I've been digging into this a couple of years ago very deeply, not just yours, but also the Microsoft version and so on. We did some implementation um, on that and so on. Um, there was also some activity within CareConnect. So there is a, a draft by Cyrus Debu from 2013 um, in terms of uh, auto discovery in a broader scope. And that would be one of my first main points. I think this should, in, so the goal of this should not be limited to email. Um, we had the discussion before on the scope of extra, so I would probably even go as far as including online storage in this, like web mm -hmm. yeah. Um because what we see when, you know, people nowadays, especially business customers, they do have calendar contacts, tasks, files, and so on, and they want all of this to work immediately and not, they don't want to have a different process for all of these things, and also client implementers don't want to implement card of cult of discovery thing in parallel and so on. Um, I Com also like completely, very... Can I just completely agreed with this? It's yeah. already in the draft. OK, fine. All I didn't get it, it because it was quite short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's not already the draft, but I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the draft don't, was... Don't take it. Don't take it. Uh, I very much like Apple's configuration profiles. So the way of having Sorry. Apple's conf configuration profiles. Mm -hmm. um, so having a way of distributing this as a file for mm -hmm. certain enterprise scripting context. Um, something you could something like do that already. I think you can do auto config XML mini files, uh, you know, locally. I think that's part also even in some client implementations. But that I think should be configured and maybe even a little bit extended. Um, so all so that would be required would be given MIME type, right? Maybe it's just mentioning it. Okay. So we need to give Murray a chance to yeah. finish yeah. out. Here. Sorry. We actually have a time already. Yeah, I, I'll be very quick. Um, my knowledge of how auto configuration might be a little stale these days, but uh, I think you might want to consult HTTP BIS about how to go about doing that. They have some strong opinions about well-known versus a reserved host name when you seem to be mm -hmm. dabbling in that area. Um, the other thing was the list of ISPs. How could you possibly keep that current? That scares me a little bit, that <laughs> depending on that, it's the same kind of thing as the PSL, which we're trying to deal with in DMARC. How could that possibly be kept reliably current? Okay. So it's, it's yeah. So yeah, yeah. So okay. The, la the last it's thing. It's a fallback. Was, the last thing was just um, I missed the bit how this fits in the charter here. So let's be just we can review it offline. I'm just like this seems a little far afield from what this working group normally covers. So maybe it is, and I'm but uh, I just I'm having a double take here. Mm. Should I respond to that or? Um, yeah. So. So regarding the database, um, yes, I see, of course, your point. Um, it was not that much work. Like I did most of the work myself with some, a lot of help from others. But, um, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, of course, it's some work. There needs to be some kind of somebody maintaining it. But it's just a fallback. Like you first ask the ASP, and if you don't find anything, then, then you get it. And uh, most people are using Gmail and iCloud and Microsoft anyway. So. Um, so what we have left here is any other business and milestone review. I don't know that we're going to, um, I'm happy to do, do those live um, and the big files, which we're just going to skip, are we? Do you want to say anything about it uh, very briefly? Um, I think Braun presented big files problem is basically how to include references to external attachments without, you know, okay. putting putting them in line and um, we just posted a draft yesterday. So there is, again, depending of, you know, whether mailman is going to be chartered or this game going to get chartered, we can see where it lands. And I told uh, uh, Pete that I'd announce uh, the EAI discussion lunch, uh, meet Pete at the registration desk at 1145.
I'm going to sit here and go through the milestones. You're welcome to leave. Um, <laughs> pretty boring. But, uh, oh, we, we ate up the time earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think you're going to get any discussion on the.